It's Monday, February 6th, and this is Ask InsoFast, How Do I? And the InsoFast panels. Now, we got a couple of great emails this weekend, and here's one from Adam. I'm considering using InsoFast in my basement as a future DIY project. One thing I was unsure about in my, is my basement ceiling height has two sunken living rooms on the main level, which translates to two ceiling heights in the basement. The lower ceiling is around seven and a half feet high, while the higher is close to eight and a half feet high. I included a photo, here it is, to illustrate. My question then is what to do at the top of the wall where the ceiling is higher. I want to use, utilize that space and keep the heights, but there's no wall at the top there for the panels to stick to. What do you recommend? Well, that's a great question, Adam, and we do handle and cover that. Let me just take you to the website first. And what you do on a website, you go to the main page and then slide over on the navigation bar to technical. Go to interior guides, click that, and then Go down to number 15, which is imperfect ceiling heights. Now, the ceiling heights, uh, there's a couple of ask in so fast there where we talk about how to cut. This is a two, four, six, seven foot high wall, and we show you how to cut the in so fast to fit the top of the wall. So, the top of the wall is pretty common, but your step back, we do get a lot of questions, so I'd like to cover that today. So let's go back. What you're talking about, the concrete wall right here, the step back with the electrical conduit going through, the lower ceiling here, the step up. So how do we handle that? Pretty easy, run the InsoFest all the way up to here, but how do we handle that step? So let's switch. And Last time I did a video, we talked about the InsoFast 2.5. This is the InsoFast 2.0. The 2.5, you can see where the studs are sort of embedded. They're kind of shadowed down, down below. But, you know, we always, we're often asked, how big of a panel are you? We're two foot by four foot, but the, the, the panels are so tight and interlock that we can piece them together and actually move them out of the way when we need to, to make demonstrations. So this is the step back that we're going to cover. Let me switch to a different camera angle. Hang on. And there we go. So this is what we're talking about, this transition, how it steps back. So let's take these panels off so we have our block wall we have our step back we have our two by four wall and our insulation in between there 16 inches on center now drywall is chalkboard with paper on either side and it can span from stud to stud. It can bridge over 16 inches. InsoFast actually has a stud. So we can bridge across from stud to stud. And we'll be for firmly supported in between. So what we have to figure out is what the depth is from here to here, from the face where the InsoFast will run up higher, what this gap is. Because what we want to do is we want to put a cross member, a wood cross member going across, to fill in this gap to support it. In fact, we want to support it on an increment of 16 inches on center. So as we go up here, we're going to put 16. Sixteen, and then we take it all the way to the top of the wall. 
but the important dimension that we have to figure out is how big of a strapping do we have to put across here. Now, get a straight edge, nice square, square straight piece of wood or a eight foot level is always best. And take a look at this gap. So once you get that gap, you want to measure this gap and then cut a piece accordingly to fit in between here. So we're going to put one there, 16 inches. From here to here, 16 inches is unsupported. From here to here, 16 inches, about an inch and a half. So what you would do would get a two by material. Put another one up here. And screw this into your strapping material in between there. So you got firm support all the way up. You're, you're blocking out is what you're doing, putting a wood nailer up there to support the insofast so you can get a flush, flat wall all the way up, making it look good. And then you can do that step. So that's, that's the first one. Well, it's one thing I do take issue with here, and that's thermal bridging. I'm looking at this fiberglass, and fiberglass is a good insulation if it's installed right. What you don't want to do is push and tuck and compact the insulation. You want to fluff the insulation out. And here we see a lot of really not good things going on here. Fiberglass is inexpensive, but it's not easy to do. And this is a pretty good example of, of a fiberglass, really good intent. They wanted to air seal any, everything, so they caulked all the two by fours. They stuffed fiberglass in there. They compacted it, pushed it in there. But you can see in a thermographic, this picture right here, this hot spot right there is where hot air comes rushing in. And you can see where the fiberglass is improperly installed and really not doing the job that you want it to do. So if we take a look at this particular application, Adam, and we look right there at that circle, you can see where it's tucked in, pushed in. Fiberglass is not effective if it is being crammed in there. You want to fluff it. And worse than that, in a rim joist, that's where the concrete wall and the band joist, the rim joist, they meet together building science and what we're starting to say that the, the practice of insulating a rim joist with fiberglass is no longer recommended. Fiberglass bats are air permeable. You have to air seal that rim joist. It is the number one air leak in the house. So what you want to do, you don't, they, they do nothing to prevent warm air, humid interior air from contact, contacting the rim joist which is cold in the winter, and water will condense, and it'll start to create a little bit of havoc, a little bit of mold and rot, and all kinds of issues going on. So if I can convince you to do anything, I would like to convince you to go to our website and go back to technical and interior guides, and then scroll down to rim joists right here read this article, take a look at what to do in this situation. You want to air seal that because if you don't air seal it and you seal that off within so fast, you're just going to force that cold air up through your, your first floor 
and it's going to be nice and cold. If you've ever torn up carpet around the outside of your house and you've seen that black, goopy stuff right by the edge of the carpet where it meets the wall, that's air being infiltrated through your wall system. So really important to air seal that. And what we recommend is kind of the poor man's spray foam, which would be to get foam board, under cut undersized and sealed off around there to give you a good tight air and insulation package. You then can put the fiberglass back into place right along this area right in here to, to pop up that R value right there. But you want to control the moisture and where the condensation point's going to occur. Here's another one. The height of our basement is nine and a half feet. I know that the panels are two foot high, but are they trimmable? Yes, they are. Again, go to the interior guides and find the uneven heights, and you can see where and how to cut the, the in so fast. And then the next question, on the in, inner and outer corners, there are nailing surfaces for drywall middle. On the inner and outer corners, are there nailing surfaces for drywall metal trim? And I'd like to cover that one right, right here. Okay, don't, oh, here we go. Now this is really nice, because it, this corner right here worked out perfect. There was one that was cut. So, is what if it doesn't line up perfectly like this? What if instead of that, we had an in-so-fast wall come in at that angle. And we have no studs right there. We think that's pretty simple. And these are available at Home Depot and Lowe's. These are metal angle iron. 25 gauge, sharp corners, and you can put the PL premium down here, glue this side, and glue that side, and then come in here and squeeze that in place, and that'll give you something to nail and screw to. Now, seriously, we're not a traditional framed wall system. You don't need to do that. And this corner right here, it is solidly backed by concrete. It is solidly backed by concrete. So this wall isn't going to flex. It's not going to move. It's not going to give. As a wood wall like this would, with the spanning of the drywall, if you were to push the drywall here, it would start to bow and flex a little bit. Because this is solidly backed with concrete, with cinder block, with brick, it doesn't flex, it doesn't move. So the corners themselves are simple enough just to tape and drywall. That's all you have to do. The drywall's not, you're really not going to be able to get your fingers underneath here to try and rip the drywall off. It's not going to flex. It's not going to move. Just tape and finish the seam. If you want to, you could put your drywall on this edge and then on this edge and put beads of the PL Premium on the corner to hold that drywall down. But you don't have to. Again, it's a little bit different where this corner comes in mighty handy is when two panels come together 
And let me see if I might have enough room to do this. If we had a corner, oh, right there. If you had an outside corner like this, this is where that comes in handy. So you can stack that up. Now that gives you a nice, sharp, straight, square edge to finish that off with drywall or wood or whatever you want to finish it with. So that's it for today. On the website, there will be links to different articles and to the webs part of the website that I recommended that you go to for further reading of this. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to go into our No Lunch, Just Learn series, the International Building Codes, New Energy Codes, and the requirements for R15 in the basement and how we can achieve that within so fast. So thanks for listening. Goodbye.